continue to throw something at me if it looks like I'm going to close it without uh, saving it. Okay, and um, let's just go ahead and look at chapter 12. Okay, now as you can see, chapter 12, we're talking about investments. And when we talk about investments that are made by companies, we're really limiting that discussion to investments in bonds, which we call debt securities, and stock, which of course are stock, right? Okay, so we're a company. We have some excess cash that we're not using in operation somehow. We decide to purchase another company's bonds. We decide to purchase another company's stock. Okay, and we're looking at how we're going to account for that. Now, we're going to see that for each of those, there's two components. There's the carrying value of that investment, which affects the balance sheet. Changes in carrying value affect the income statement and then we're going to see that we're going to have interest earnings for the bonds which will affect our income statement and then we're going to see how we're going to treat dividend earnings on stock and it's two different methods that we could be using we could be using um, the fair value method or we be, could be using something called the equity method okay so we'll take a look at all that okay so let's start out with debt securities debt securities there are various, we're really focusing on investment in bonds, okay? Uh, items that do not include uh, debt securities or options, lease contracts. We've already studied accounts and notes receivable. So we're really talking about, can limit it in our minds uh, at this stage to uh, investment in bonds, okay? So what happens? A company invests in a bond and the amount that they pay for the bond is based on the present value of the cash flows that are going to come from that bond. So if we have a bond that is a $700,000 bond and the uh, interest rate on that bond is 6%, uh, then we're going to get what? We're going to get a 12% semi-annual bond. We're going to get a 6% return on that in cash every six months, right? We would take the 700000 times a 6%, and that would give us the $42,000. And, of course, we're going to get the principal back at the end. Okay, now how much we pay for this bond today is predicated on the present value of these two cash flows, right? So we get present value of a dollar because it's a one-time payment for the principal, present value of an annuity for the uh, interest since that comes what? every six months for the next, what, uh, how many years is this bond? Three years, so six semi-annual periods, okay? Now, just to remember where these numbers would come from, you would go to the present value table, you'd go to six, per, uh, uh, how many periods, six periods? You'd come over to the 6% column, that would be the factor that you would use for the principal, okay, where'd I go? Uh, what is the uh, market rate of interest on this? 14%. So we take the market rate of interest, we divide that by two, that's what? 7%, right? So 7% for six periods is where they got that uh, one factor, the 0 0.666, whatever. Okay, a little bit of a different rounding here. Okay, and then we go to the present value of the annuity table, six periods at 7%, 4.7. Six seven, okay, which is where they got that number, give or take. Okay, get the present value of both of those, and so somebody's willing to pay six hundred and sixty-six dollars, six hundred and thirty-three, six hundred sixty-six thousand, six hundred and thirty-three dollars for this bond. Okay, so when we buy the bond, we debit investment in bond seven hundred thousand. That's for the principal. We are going to sit here and credit the cash for the amount of cash that we're going to pay for this bond difference is the discount okay and so if you were to just sort of tee this up a little bit and i'm going to try to do as much of this as i can with the screen up today i think it works a little better if the screen is up although sometimes we're reading off the wood and so uh you'll probably We'll probably sit here and fight with this, putting it up and down, depending on what we're looking at. Okay, but if we were to tee this up, we would go ahead and tee up bond payable. And what was it, 700000 Not bond payable, because this were bond investment.
for 700,000. And we would go ahead and what? Credit the discount. And in this case, we're crediting the discount for the difference, 33,367. Okay, now when we report that bond investment on the balance sheet, we would have what? Bond investment, and we'd probably just show it net. So 700,000 minus the discount of 3367. So we'd show bond investment, and it would be the amount of cash we paid for that, 666633. What is it? 633? Okay. Okay, good. So that's, um, you know, what we would pay for the bond. That's the entry that we make. I am not going to be holding you accountable for looking up numbers on present value tables and that to figure out. We'll tell you how much they paid for the bond versus the face of the bond so that you know what the carrying value of the bond is. Okay. All right, good. Now you come over and uh, we take a look and we say that... Uh, Master wear bonds have a stated rate of 12% payable semi-annually. This means that every six months we'll get the 42,000, 700,000 face amount times what? 12% divided by two gives me the $42,000 interest of cash received, right? Cash interest. But the interest revenue is based on the carrying amount of the bond, right? Okay, so we take whatever the face was minus the discount gives me the interest revenue of 46664 So there's a difference, isn't there? Okay. That difference then is going to amortize the discount. Okay. So our cash interest is 42000 but our effective interest using what? Using the market rate of interest 0 0.07 times the carrying amount of the bond gives me the 46664. So you do need to know how to calculate the interest on this bond. It's market rate of interest times the carrying value of the bond, right? That difference then becomes the amortization of the discount, okay? So if you just look at the journal entry that we come up with right here near the bottom, and you do need to know the, this, well, this is the journal entry uh, when they sold the bond. Where's my journal entry for my interest? I guess it's up there somewhere. Where'd my journal entry for my interest go? I know it was there a minute ago. So I looked at, oh, here it is. It's at the top. I looked at it 10 times. Okay, and so what happens? Debit the cash. Debit the discount to amortize it, and we book the interest revenue, okay, which you saw how we calculated that on the previous slide, right? Interest revenue right here, okay? Difference is the discount, and, of course, we're getting the cash. Now, when we go ahead and we debit that discount for four, what is it, six, six, four? Okay, the balance now in the discount account becomes 28,000, write the balance over here, 28,703, doesn't it? And so now the carrying value of the bond is what? 671297. Okay, it's what? It goes up. By the amount of discount amortization, because the discount is subtracting. When you make the discount smaller by amortizing it, the carrying value of the bond goes up, doesn't it? Okay. So if I were to figure out or ask you the interest for the next six months, you would do what? You would take this six seven one two nine seven, and you would multiply that by market rate or stated rate of interest by the market rate of interest, in fact, here it is right here, right? I don't know why I'm writing on the board. It's right here in front of us. Times the 7% would give us the interest for the next six months and so on. Okay? Okay. So pretty straightforward there of stuff that's really probably pretty much a review for you. Okay? Now you come over and you take a look at um, the entry now to sell the bond. So in this question, they contemplated that they sold it when the discount still had 28703, which is that situation over there. 
right? And they sold it, and they sold it for a cash of 725000 They're assuming that was the fair market value at that point in time, and they sold it. So you debit cash 725000 You go ahead and you debit the discount to clear the discount. You credit bond payable to get rid of the bond payable, right? And then the gain is going to be the difference between the 671,297, the carrying amount, and what you sold it for, which was what? 725? We sold it for 725,000. Carrying amount of the investment was what? 671,297. That's a difference of how much? 53703, I hope. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be sending a letter to the editor of the book, okay? Which last time I used this book, I had to do that a few times because they messed up on some of their calculations, but it looks like they cleaned that up. Okay. Question? Okay. Now, when we look at how this affects our financial reports, this is, and they probably should have done a better job to make sure we knew which year is which year here now. Um, I think this is 2018, this is 2019, the way they set this up. Anyway, one is the first year, the other one is the year of sale when they decided to sell it. Okay, and so in 2018, notice we have what? We just have the interest for 2018. And in the question pattern, they said they sold it like January 5th. So they're not worrying about accruing a few days interest. I mean, if you were doing this in the real world and you're carrying, you know, millions of dollars in bond investments and you sell them, it could be material to calculate the interest for three or four days. In this problem, they just ignored it. Okay, ignored the three or four days interest. And they're simply showing what the gain from the sale, right? Okay, on the balance sheet, notice that we carry the bond at what? at its carrying value, which would have been 666633 minus 28,000. I, I, uh, I'm not that. 700,000 minus what? Minus the 28,703, which would have given us this 671,297, right? The face of the bond minus the discount at the end of the year. And then, um, of course, our retained earnings is going to increase when we close our revenue account, right, for the uh, having for our, our gain account, our interest revenue account. When we close that, that'll go into retained earnings. And then we've sold the bond now, and we close that into retained earnings to get 100,000 retained earnings. Okay? Question? Okay, good. All right, now. That bond that we just accounted for and the work that we just did there was assuming that we were treating that bond as a held to maturity. Notice we did not adjust the carrying value of the bond for changes in the market value. It was carried at what? Amortized cost. There were no unrealized holding gains and losses. The only time that we took a gain is when we actually realized it, when we actually sold the bond, right? That is a held to maturity bond that we just accounted for. We had the interest revenue. We didn't mark it to market each period on the balance sheet. We just left it at what? Amortized cost, which was cost minus the discount. Okay. And the only income statement impact was the actual revenue for the interest revenue. Okay. Now we're going to take a look at what happens if we have a bond that is considered a trading security or available for sale security. Okay. Now, the balance sheet effect for both of these is the same. We will mark the bond to market each period. Okay. Now, when we mark the bond to market, if we mark it up, that's going to generate an unrealized gain, isn't it? Okay. That unrealized gain will be reported on the income statement if we're talking about a trading security. The idea is that we're probably trading that daily, if not hourly, so we run unrealized holding gains and losses through the income statement. If it isn't available for sale security, and sometimes students ask me, well, how do I know if it's available for sale security? Well, the problem tells you. And if you're in practice, you know if it's available for sale if it's not 
held to maturity and it's not trading. So available for sale is what? The catch-all category for things that don't fall in the other two categories. And if it's available for sale security, we will mark it to market on the balance sheet. We still carry it at fair value, but unrealized holding gains and losses now don't go to the income statement. They become part of our other comprehensive income. Okay, remember, guys, we talked about other comprehensive income in Chapter 4 or whatever it was when we were talking about the income statement. So we've already had some practice with this. Okay, now, we do have the fair value option. And under the fair value option, FASB GAAP, U.S. GAAP, allows companies to treat securities that are supposed to be available for sale as though they were trading securities. So if that's the case, no difference in the balance sheet effect, but unrealized holding gains and losses will now be reflected on the income statement instead of the other comprehensive income statement. Okay. Okay. Now let's just go ahead and let's go through and see what uh, some of the key characteristics are. We'll first do trading and then we'll do available for sale. Now when we are looking here, we're talking about debt securities, but we can also classify our equity securities as trading as well. Okay, and so unrealized holding gains and losses on equity securities will also be uh, running through the income statement. Okay, we're basically thinking that we are you know, trading these daily, hourly. There's an active trading going on with these types of securities that we put in the trading category. Okay, so they're carried at fair value on the balance sheet, as we've already stated, and what? Unrealized holding gains and losses run through the income statement. Okay, typically, guys, these are considered current assets. Okay, you can default to carrying these as current assets unless there's some unique weird thing going on where they're still counting as trading even though they plan on holding it for longer than a year. Well, you see that trading is usually measured in terms of hours, right? So typically it's going to be a current asset. It you know, can be non-current if you have a unique situation with a particular company whose operating cycles may be more than a year or something, then you could go ahead and start to think maybe it would be non-current, okay? okay. Now you come over and you take a look at the security, how we'll analyze it. It has an amortized cost. It has its fair value, okay? And notice here, we take a fair value adjustment here of 43,646. That's the difference between its fair value and its amortized cost at any point in time, right? Because we're gonna carry it at fair value. Okay, so if they tell us it has a fair value of, okay, let's try to get back here. If they tell us it has a fair value of 714943 at December 31st, 2018, we will debit fair value adjustment and we will credit it unrealized holding gain. That's the difference between the fair value and the amortized cost at year end. Okay, so that is going to be reported on the income statement, isn't it? Because this is a trading security, okay? Now, just to understand how that will look on the balance sheet, we're going to have what? 700,000 was what we had originally paid for that bond. Just to see how we're getting the carrying value of the bond. 700,000 is what we had originally paid for the bond, but the bond had a discount, didn't it? And that discount was, oh, I forgot the amount of the discount now. I shouldn't have erased it. I had it right there. The discount was what? 28,703. We subtract the discount, but then we have the fair value adjustment and the fair value adjustment did what? Fair value adjustment was a debit, wasn't it? So it increased this investment. Okay, so the fair value adjustment is 43,646. So when you get to the carrying value of that bond, you end up with this 714,943. 
Have we adjusted it to the market showing on the balance sheet at its market value now? And that gain, the increase, did what? It went to the income statement, didn't it? Hello? Come on, guys. We're going to have to get through this stuff today. I can't be sitting there wondering if you got it or not. Okay? Uh-huh. Oh. Oh, sure, yeah, okay. So, all right, so the petition for the CPA review course. Okay, can I say something before I go into it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, and I'm not bribing her to do that because um, <laughs> basically, um, well, I don't know. Maybe you're pushing for any review course. I'm thinking Becker, so, but any review course um, you might want to have. So, okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Leadership is hard, huh? Yeah. It's not. It's some people make it seem easy to stand up here and talk to the class, right? Okay, good. Very good. Good job. Thank you. Okay. Good job. Okay. So this is the carrying value of the bond now. Okay, and we take the what the increase that we have increased the carrying value. That's a gain. That is a trading security. So that's part of my net income, right? Okay. Okay. Good. Now what happens? Notice that we go a little bit further now, and what? Here's my amortized cost six seven one nine twenty one. Now this is at the end of what? At the end of um, 2019, so the amortized cost has come up a little bit, hasn't it? Okay, because we've amortized some of that discount, and now they tell me fair value is 725, right? That's at the end, that's not at the end of 2019, but that's January 5th, 2019. Remember where they sold it? It was 725 for when it was a held to maturity security. So now we need a fair value adjustment of 53,703, don't we? Now, right now, the fair value adjustment has it, and I'm just going to write it up here. I think there's a slide here in a second that shows it to you. Fair value adjustment account right now has this 43,646, okay? But we want it to be what? 53,703, don't we? So we're going to debit it by enough, 10,000 something, to bring it up to that 53,703. Okay. And so that's exactly what they wrote here. Okay. And when they make that adjustment, it's 10,057. And that brings it to 53,703, doesn't it? Okay. I'm not going to recompute to that it'll bring it to the carrying value that we want at 725. I'm not going to redo this because I'd have to write a new fair value. I have to write a new uh, discount amount, and now this would be 57, right? And that would bring it to the new carrying value that we desire here, which is 725, right? I don't want to. I don't feel like looking up the amount for the discount right now. Okay, unless someone's got that in their head. No. Okay one particular person that says spit, spit numbers like that in their head. Okay, so it's 35-something. I forget, okay, what it would be now. Okay, all right, good. So that's the adjustment that we make there. Now, you come over. You know what? I'm going to do it. It's right here. It's a couple clicks away. The what? By the time we sell that bond, what, the, uh, I don't know. I don't feel like figuring it out. Whatever the discount would be. I'm not going to write it. Okay, so what happens? We come over and we sold that bond now. We have this 53,703, and then we turn around and we sell the bond. And when we sell the bond, we sell it for what? We sell it for cash, 725. 
There's the discount, 28,703, okay, which is what we have up there, right? So when I guess we make the discount, what? Yeah, because it's the next day, isn't it? So the discount doesn't change. So when we make the fair value adjustment, 53,703, that brings the carrying value up to 725. That brings the carrying value up to 725,000. And now we sell the bond, right? For 725,000. And when we sell the bond, we do what? Debit cash for 725. We go ahead, we debit the discount for whatever's left to get rid of the discount, don't we? And then we credit the investment, because remember, we were, had put 700,000 in there when we first got the investment. We debit 700,000, now we're getting rid of it. And we take our fair value adjustment and credit it to get rid of it, right? And the fair value adjustment is constituted of the gain that we took in 2018, the gain that we took in 2019, right? Question? Okay, good. Now, um, I, 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 I thought I got rid of this. I don't want this slide. All they're saying is what if the company hadn't done anything until it actually sold the bond? It hadn't caught up the fair value adjustment before it sold the bond. Then we would go ahead and have to take the 10000 gain. But I wanted to get rid of this slide. Don't worry about this slide. All this does is bring in another path to the same outcome. We're just going to stick with what we just said. So don't worry about that. That's just nonsense. It's not going to help you much. Okay, it's just another thing that what happened if the company hadn't taken the 10057 into the valuation, um, into the uh, fair value adjustment account at before it sold the bond, then you'd have to recognize the gain, right? And the amount that you take out of the valuation, fair value adjustment would be the 43. Anyway, forget it. I t thought I took that out. Okay, all right. Now, what happens? Income statement and the statement of comprehensive income, the gain is just going to hit the income statement, isn't it? The entire gain hits the income statement. Balance sheet, we reported it at, what, fair value until we sold it, didn't we? And then cash flow, and this is kind of important. I mean, you're going to study the cash statement of cash flows in the next class in two, but it's uh, worthwhile. I don't think I'll test you on it, but you might as well start getting that in your head now as to how we treat the cash flow. And when it's a trading security, the cash flows for the interest on this, for the sale of this, are all treated as operating activity because we're saying, hey, this is our day-to-day. -day. We trade these bonds all the time, don't we? Okay, so it goes into the uh, operating activity. Okay, so you take a look here, guys. You can see what there was the um, the interest income right here, the four six six four, the four three six four six was the um, valuation gain. That was in 2018. Okay, and then when we got to what when we got to January 5th, whatever 2019. Then what? Then we just had the valuation gain, and we sold the thing, right? Okay. And so uh, our what? Our comprehensive income, our other comprehensive incomes are zero because these are what? Our trading securities, aren't they? Okay. It was carried on the balance sheet at 714-943. At the end of that first year, we sold it in the second year, didn't we? And then our retained earnings was what? The sum of the interest income plus the valuation gain, and then the what? Valuation gain in uh, year two when we sold it. Gain on the sale. And this one was what? This one was unrealized. This one was realized, wasn't it? By the time we sold it. That was the difference between the 1231 2018 value and the January 5th value. Statement of cash flows, notice what? It is going to be in the all of its operating activity because these are trading securities. Okay. All right, good. All right, let's take a look at available for sale. 
okay and available for sale securities are those that don't fall into either of the two other categories that we've talked about they are neither held to maturity nor are they trading security okay um, we report on the balance sheet at fair value just like we do trading but our unrealized holding gains and losses instead of being part of net income are going to be what are going to be other comprehensive income okay so now we go ahead and in that first year we have the fair value adjustment we still debit the fair value adjustment for the 43,646 don't we just like we did under the trading situation okay but now the credit the income is not going to go to net income it's going to go to what other comprehensive income right OCI okay so we have that 43,646 and just to uh, remind you because sometimes my students have trouble figuring out what happens to OCI at the end of the year we'll do what we'll debit unrealized OCI will debit it to close it for 43646 won't we okay and we'll credit what accumulated OCI 43646 that accumulated OCI I'll just write it over here is like the retained earnings for my comprehensive income isn't it remember we talked about that before it's like the retained earnings for my comprehensive income. So it sits in there. I close that out. This is going to be closed out just like I would close out revenue and expenses for my income. For my other comprehensive income, I close them out as well, right? Those are temporary accounts. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and again, same security. It's just now being classified as what? available for sale so in January 5th around the time they're going to get ready to sell it it's up to 725,000 so now we realize we need what we need 53,703 in the valuation adjustment so just like we did for the um, trading situation now we debit fair value adjustment for that difference don't we Okay, so we still debit the fair value adjustment for the difference. And again, because it's an available for sale security, we don't credit net income, we credit what? OCI, don't we? Okay, and so we come to the end of the year. Do we need to close this? We close this, and so we will debit unrealized OCI, whatever, and it's what, 10000 Zero fifty-seven this time, and we'll credit accumulated OCI, ten thousand zero fifty-seven, and so now accumulated OCI when we credit that for ten thousand zero fifty-seven, accumulated OCI has this balance in here. It matches what's in the adjustment account, doesn't it? Right. Okay, so now what? Now when we get rid of the security, we do what? We debit a reclassification adjustment, OCI 53,703, and we credit fair value adjustment. Now when we credit fair value adjustment, 53,703, that closes it out, doesn't it? This reclassification adjustment is just for this one year that we took amounts out of what out of other comprehensive income and we're going to put them into net income because we sold this thing right so at the end of the year we will close this by debiting accumulated other comprehensive income for 53,703 we will credit this reclass adjustment because it appears on my what other comprehensive income statement which is a income statement I close everything out on the income statement don't I so when I credit this for 53,703 I go ahead and um, debit my accumulated OCI this is closed now isn't it 
that entry closes this, so this is zero, and I debit. 53,703. So I've gotten the amounts out of accumulated other comprehensive income, haven't I? Those amounts are out of there? Okay. And then when I actually, you know, go ahead and record the sale, here comes the cash. Get rid of the discount. The discount was the 28,703. Get rid of the investment, and I credit what? Gain, and that now will show up where? on the income statement, right? Okay. Now, when you're looking at some of the homework questions or quiz questions here in a minute, what I'm going to be showing you is the amount of gain you take in the year of sale is the difference between what? Whatever the amortized cost is and what you're selling it for, right? That's the gain. Doesn't matter what you had taken into other comprehensive income before that, because you're going to class that out of what? other comprehensive income so that you take it out of a uh, accumulated other comprehensive income so you can credit this gain and then that gain will be closed to what account? What account will the gain be closed to? Huh? Well, income statement and ultimately what? Retain earnings, right? Isn't that where net income goes? Okay. Okay, good. All right, so let's bring the screen back down. And um, income statement, gains in uh, the other comprehensive income statement, it's OCI, isn't it? It's not on the income statement. Balance sheet, reported fair value just like the trading security, right? Okay. <laughs> When we get to the statement of cash flows, then what? Well, and the unrealized holding gains and losses sit as part of what other uh, accumulated other comprehensive income, right? Not They don't go to retained earnings. And then the cash flow statement is classified as investing activity, okay? And it makes sense. It's easy to remember that it goes into investing activity. What are we studying in this chapter? Investments, right? I won't ask you about statement of cash flows on your exam, but you might as well start to realize where these things are reported on statement of cash flows. Okay? All right. Now, if you take a look at the comparison here of the two methods side by side, this is a nice little summary of what we did differently. And notice that what? When we were dealing with a trading security, the amounts went into net income in the period in which we had the actual gain. Right? Okay, this was the difference for 2018, the difference for 2019, and then we sold the security. Okay? When we were dealing with what? When we were dealing with available for sale or calling it available for sale, we put amounts into OCI. They got closed out to what? Accumulated OCI, like I wrote up here on the board. And then what? And then when we finished up our reclassification adjustment, we debited. OCI 53,703 and credit the fair value adjustment. And then you saw the journal entry where we then take the entire gain into net income, right? Question? Okay, good. That's good. This is about as hard as Chapter 12 gets. Okay, this is about uh, the maximum of difficulty here when you're dealing with the available for sale. Okay, because the reclassification adjustment. You got to take it out, you got to put it in, you got to take it out, and you put it into net income, right? Okay, and you can see the way the effect is on the financial statements. There's my what? My um, gain, my uh, interest revenue, I should say. There was no realized gain because it's available for sale in year one, okay, but there was what? the OCI gain. So I take my net income plus other comprehensive income equals net income. Remember I told you you need to walk in the house and scare your family? Hey, did you know that in net income plus other, plus other comprehensive income equals comprehensive income? And they'll go, whoa, we can't talk to them no more. What'd they do to them over there at San Jose State? Okay. Then what? Then in year two, there's what? There's the unrealized a uh, holding gain uh, that comes on to my other comprehensive income, right? But then I had what? 
I had the reclassification adjustment, didn't I? Which took it out. That's why I had that total debit of 53,703 to the OCI. Okay. And there's what? There's my actual gain up there. So net net comprehensive income gives me the what? The amount that actually came in this year because I'm netting out the difference between the reclassification adjustment and the amount of what unrealized that came in plus the amount that was in there previously. Okay. Okay, balance sheet, no difference between that and trading. Statement of cash flows, we said it's going to be what? I didn't put the statement of cash flows, it's investing. Yeah. Okay. Question? All right. Fair value option says this. Fair value option says that if you want to, you can take your available for sale securities and treat them like trading securities. And unrealized holding gains and losses will go through the income statement. That's all the fair value option says. Okay, good. Now let's go ahead and take a look at what we're going to do for our equity investments. Now, if we are using the method um, of recognizing our income through fair value approach, if that's the case, then we're going to be doing everything we just did but instead of having interest revenue, we're going to have what? Dividend revenue. Okay. Now, that's the case if you own a small share of the stock, like um, you own 2% of the stock. You own 10%. You own 15%. You own 19% you own of the stock of the company. And they're looking at that and saying that you do not have control of that company, significant influence of that company. Once you go, significant influence, I shouldn't say control, significant influence. Once you go past 20% or you hit 20%, once you hit 20%, you go past 19.99999 and you go to 20%, then they tell us to use the equity method. Under the equity method, and I think the equity method is easier, quite frankly, we are going to sit there and we are going to look at what the income is in the investee, and we're going to take our percentage of our ownership as our investment income. So if we own 30% of the stock and the investee had 100000 of net income, we will increase our investment account by 30000 and our um, interest um, our uh, investment income, I should say, is going to be what? $30,000. To me, easier. Now, if there is a payout of dividends, the payout of dividends doesn't constitute more income. It constitutes a reduction in the carrying amount of the investment. Okay? All right. So let's just go ahead and um, let's take a look at um, the two methods that I just mentioned. It might have been better if I had this slide up here at the time, which when I was talking about it, which is fair value through net income method, that's when you have what? Less than 20% of the stock. And so we're going to do what? We're going to basically do what we just learned for the calculation of the gains and all that for the uh, security. And we're going to do what? We're going to uh, use the dividend, take the dividends as income. Equity method, we're going to take our share of the investee's income, and dividends will reduce the amount that we hold in the uh, investment account. Beyond the scope of this class, guys, I mean, you should know that once you get to a point where you own more than 50% of the stock, 50.000001, once you go past 50%, you consolidate. So you don't use neither the equity method nor the fair value through net income method. You basically, what, mush the financial statements of the two companies together. That's consolidation. That's advanced accounting. That's not something we're going to get into in this class, obviously. Okay? Okay, good. So let's just go ahead and take a look at the um, situation where we do the, um, and this is called reporting method, uh, fair value through net income. It used to be called the cost method, so that's why I have to keep looking at the slide because it used to be very easy to say the cost method versus the equity method. They had to make it difficult so that I don't remember the name of it. Now it's fair value through net income method. 
used to be called cost method, and then the equity method. So first we're going to look at fair value through um, <laughs> fair value through net income because it's going to go through our net income, whatever. Okay, and notice they buy this investment, what, July 1st? 2018 okay and they buy it for 1.5 at December 31st they get a $75,000 cash dividend the fair value has fallen from what 1,450,000 uh, 1,500,000 to 1,450,000 okay and then that next year they sell it for a little bit more than that don't they okay okay so let's just go ahead and let's see what happens here and we make the investment easy enough and then the dividend revenue is whatever the dividend is that they paid to us, 75000 Now, be careful because here they told me that we received a cash dividend of 75000 Some of the, uh, I think at least one of the problems we'll look at in a second uh, in the quiz and potentially in your exam will have the situation where they tell you the whole dividend that was paid. And you're going to have to know that you only count the dividends from the time that you purchased the stock. So if they say they pay the dividend at what? At December 31st, you would only take what? Or if they say the dividends are paid every quarter is what I should say. And there was a dividend in the first quarter, second quarter, but what? You don't, you didn't own the stock then, did you? So you only take the dividends that are paid during the time that you actually what? actually own the stock right so you got to watch the date sometimes on that here they just told us they received 75,000 okay so you go ahead you debit the cash credit dividend revenue easy enough and then we have to do our fair value adjustment don't we just like we did a minute ago for the trading securities right and so you come over and you do what you need 50,000 in there and so you're going to want to uh, de decrease. We lost this time, didn't we? So we're going to debit our unrealized holding loss and credit the fair value adjustment. Why didn't they show the credit there? I, you know, as an accountant, I can't let that go. Okay. So I put the. Uh, I thought the next slide had it. I don't know. We got to put that fifty thousand there. Okay. And now it's got the fifty thousand. Okay, and this time it's a credit because we're bringing the fair value down, aren't we? Okay, okay, good. Now you come over and, uh, oh, now what? Now the, I guess, why don't they, well, I'm not sure why they're not putting that. Okay, but it's what, 50,000, we need what? We need another four. This is the next year. So the next year we debit unrealized loss for 1,000, that's for 2019. Credit the fair value adjustment for, I guess maybe they wanted us to do this together, for 4000 Does that bring it to 4000 I mean to 54000 excuse me. And then when you go ahead and you sell the stock, debit the cash, go ahead and do what? Debit the fair value adjustment. It didn't come back. It went down further, didn't it? I think I said it went, came back. It went down further, right? So you put that into the fair value adjustment to close it, and you credit the investment. Okay. Now, if you don't sell the stock, then what? Then you're just going to look, and this is the way you do it every time. What's in the fair value adjustment? What do I need to get it to the correct balance? That's the amount that you'll take for the loss that period, and that's the amount that you'll credit to the fair value adjustment, right? In this second slide, these are mutually exclusive. They're simply assuming that they held the stock as opposed to sold it. Okay. Again, balance sheet could be current or non-current, depending on what the company is planning to do with that stock. Okay. They plan to hold it for a long term or short term. It could be what? Cash flow of operating or investing depending on whether it's short term or long term okay now equity method if you get to the equity method now we're going to go ahead and see that we have what we can influence and we say 20 to 50 because it fit over 50 you do what you consolidate right okay so let's just go ahead and take a look at the equity method 
okay? And I just want to get to the uh, discussion here in which they tell us that um, we have purchased 30% of the stock. The total fair value of the company is $5 million, so we're paying $1.5 million for that, okay? The net income of the subsidiary is $25,000, and they paid $250,000 of dividends. We bought this on what? January 1st, somewhere, okay? I know it's January 1st because they're going to take the investment, okay? And then they're going to do what? They're going to take 30% of the entire net income. So they must have bought this stock on January 1st, okay? Because they take the whole year's worth of net income. Dividends, 250000 and notice, we, let me not jump too quick. Notice here, guys, that we debit the investment, don't we? We debit the investment and credit the investment revenue for our share of the net income of the subsidiary. Okay. And then the dividend, we take 30% of that. Again, they bought the stock on January 1st. I don't know where it says it, but anyway, they bought the stock on January 1st. So they take their share of the entire investment. So they debit of the entire dividend, I should say. So they debit the cash for the seventy-five thousand. They credit the investment revenue. I mean, uh, investment in stock. Excuse me. They they credit the investment account. Okay. So if you're ever trying to figure out the investment account, it's what beginning balance plus what our share of the subsidiary's net income minus what our share of the subsidiary's dividends, and that's what goes into the investment account. Or that should be the balance, I should say, of the investment account. Question? Okay, good. Thank you, sir. Save it. Keep, right? File, save as, we'll call it markup. Thank you, sir. Whoever, whoever it was, thank you. Okay, all right, good. Let's go ahead and let's close that. And let's get to the quiz. How does this class get out? 45, so we got what? Uh, 20 minutes? Okay, so we should be able to take a good chunk out of this quiz. Let's go for it, all right? All right, now you look at this question and they want to know what amount is going to be reported as unrealized gain loss in year two's income statement. And they give me two years worth of data here, year one, year two, right? Okay, now. What I did was I just went through and did the things that we just did up here on the board for the two years so we can sort of follow the bouncing ball, okay, as to what went on here. And so in year one, we would have done what? We would have debited the loss for 50000 and credited the fair value adjustment for 50000 So I am just wrote in here the year one journal entry. Just did it to save us a little time here. Debit the loss, credit the fair value adjustment. Yes, I think, I hope, unless I didn't hit the record button. It's recording? Did I hit the record button? Did I? Yeah, it says recording, yeah. <laughs> Some of my best work hit the cutting room floor. Okay, so what happens? We sit here and we debit the loss, we credit fair value adjustment, 50000 okay? Now, when we debit the loss, of course, we have to what? We have to close the loss, so we'll debit the, uh, we'll credit the loss, we'll debit OCI, right? There'll be 50000 sitting in OCI. I'll just put it right here. Accumulated OCI. Oh, no, this is not. This is uh, what? This is a trading security, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's why you guys are looking at me like that. These are trading securities, okay? Because it's asking me what? On the income statement? So we'll take that loss of 50000 to the income statement. But that's year one, isn't it? Okay. Okay, good. Then we go into year two. And when we go into year two, it's come back from what? The trading security has come back. And notice here, we had to know to ignore available for sale, didn't we? Because they asked us for the income statement. So we had to know to ignore available for sale. So when we sit here and we get to year two now, we look and what? This thing is up 55,000, isn't it? Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and we want to bring it up so that the carrying value and the fair value adjustment is 5,000, don't we? Okay, so it'll be the cost plus the fair value adjustment. So to do that, we have to what? Debit fair value adjustment 55,000, don't we? So now it has the balance of 5,000. So now the carrying value of the security will be what? The original cost of 150 plus the 5,000 in the fair value adjustment. We'll bring it up to uh, 155, which is where we want it for year two. And so when we debit the fair value adjustment 55, we credit the gain 55, don't we, for year two? And that's reported on the income statement. Okay. Okay, good. Um, that was a CPA exam question. I think you recognize those by now by the way they look. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Um, some of these questions I had already used the test bank for, uh, but I wanted to bring one CPA question. And UC Berkeley, this is part of Intermediate 2 for some reason, and here it's part of Intermediate 1. And I had done two at Berkeley and one here. And so I just took questions that I had already identified for the test bank. Uh, but I wanted to put at least one CPA exam question in here. So most of these are test bank questions, okay? All right, so which of the following investment securities held by Zoogle Inc. may be classified as held in maturity? Does stock have a maturity? Only bonds can be what? Held in maturity, right? Okay, so it would have to be the long-term debenture bonds. You guys told me to put more questions like this on the exam so they don't take as long. Okay, so we'll, we'll, I'll remember to do that. Which of the following investment securities held by Zoogle Inc. are not reported at fair value in its balance sheet? It's what? Held in maturity is carried at amortized cost, right? Okay, using the following, answer questions four through six. Okay, so I don't know. Is it lining up? No. I guess we're going to answer. Well, yeah, it is four through six, but it does beg the question of where is three. I don't know. Three called in sick. Okay. All right. So you take a look and we say when balance sheet amount would Bedsford report uh, for the total investment in debt securities at uh, 12-31-2017? Okay, now you look at that and you know you have to focus on 2017 and um, you have to pick up the right amounts, fair value or amortized cost of the trick here, right? Okay, so when we do this, we're going to pick up for the held to maturity, do you want to pick up amortized cost or fair value? Excuse me? Hello? Amortized cost, right? You know the test is a week from today. You know that, right? Okay. Okay, good. When you sit here and you look at um, the trading securities, is it going to be fair value or, or cost? Fair value. So I'm going to have to pick up all these amounts, right? For the available for sale, is it fair value or amortized cost? Fair value. So if you add the numbers that I've checked here, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, you should get 637000 Okay. Okay, good. Number what, five? 
what would the balance in Bedsford's accumulated other comprehensive income with respect to these investments in 12-31-2018 balance sheet show? Okay. Now, that's after two years of this, isn't it? And you take a look here, and we know we have to focus on the um, available for sale security, don't we? Okay. So I think that's why the problem only gave us one security in there, so we didn't have to sit there and mess with a bunch of moving parts on this okay so you look and let's do 2017 first okay 2017 fair value is 13500 when the cost was 140000 right so I'm going to debit OCI and I'm going to credit valuation uh, adjustment 9500 right hello when I do, that's year one right there, I credit the valuation adjustment and I debit my um, OCI and then at the end of the year, I have to close the OCI, don't I? Don't I have to close that account? So I credit OCI and I debit accumulated OCI 9500, right? To close it. Okay, good. Then I look and at the end of year two, the amount difference is what? Oh, well, this stock has come back or whatever it is. Bonds have come back pretty good. 10,400, they've come back. They, they, they have an increase 10,400 above cost, don't they? So now I need a what? Debit of 10,4 in the valuation adjustment, right? No, I need a value of 10,4. The difference between the fair value at 2018 and the cost of 140. I need to write it up to 10.5, right? The valuation adjustment needs to have a balance at the end of 10.4, right? Okay. So you're looking at that 19.9 because what's going to happen? I have to debit the valuation adjustment for 19.9 to bring the balance to 10.4, don't I? Now it's got the 10.4 I need in there, so it's at 50,400 now. Is the total carrying value of this bond? Okay. And so when I do that, I debit the valuation allowance 19.9. I credit OCI 19.9, don't I? Okay. And then of course at the end of the year I do what? I close OCI, right? So I debit the OCI and I credit the accumulated OCI 19.9. And when I credit the accumulated OCI, 19.9, now what? The original debit of 9.5 from year one, the credit of 19.9 from year two, I end up with 10,400 in there, don't I? Do I end up with 10,400 in there? Now, I walked you through the whole process so you see what's going on, but on your exam, the amount that should be in the valuation allowance and the what? Accumulated OCI at any point in time is the difference between the cost and the fair value of the investment at the end of the year, isn't it? Isn't that what needs to be in there? Okay, so you don't have to go through the, all this to answer this question. You'll have plenty of time to do it and okay if you want to. It helps you to keep track of what's going on, but I'm just telling you the shortcut is the logic that allows you to do the shortcut is what? It should be the difference between whatever I need in the valuation allowance, that's what should be in the OCI for a accumulated OCI for an available for sale security, right? And it's sitting in there waiting for the day when I sell it. If I sold it the next day, what will happen? I'll sit there and I will debit, uh, excuse me, now that it's up, I'll credit the valuation allowance. I'll debit accumulated OCI, right? And it'll be gone. And then I can just take the difference between whatever I sell it for and the carrying value at that point in time. And that's going to go into my net income, right? Okay, good. What total unrealized holding gain would Bedsford report in 2018 income statement uh, relative to its investment in debt security? So if they're asking me income statement, I got to do what? I got to look at my trading securities, don't I? Held to maturity securities, we don't take any unrealized holding gains and losses, right? So I simply look at the trading, and all I did here, guys, was I compared the fair value at the end of 17 to the fair value at the end of 
18, and that change goes into net income, doesn't it, for trading securities? So I calculated all those differences, and when I did, I got this total net difference of 36,000. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at this next one. And uh, January 1st, 2018, Rupar retailers purchased 100,000 of and company bonds at a discount of 5,000. Okay, now let's just deal with that right out of the gate here. And I'm going to put this... Uh, screen up for this one we can control it now so we've got this investment that we bought at a discount of 50,000 so we're gonna have what we're gonna have investment what was it hundred thousand and discount is 5,000, so the carrying value of that investment is 95,000, isn't it? Okay, now I take that 95,000, and if I, it asks me, what is my investment revenue at for 2018? Now, this is what? January 1st, 2018, did I get this? And what? 6% bonds were purchased when market rate was. 7% for bonds of similar risk, and uh, the bonds pay what? 6%, and they pay the interest what? Semi annually on January 1st and July 1st. So I'm going to have to sit here and amortize this thing during these two six month periods, right? So I've got what? 100,000 times 0 0.06 times 1 half means this bond pays what per is it three thousand okay that's every six months for a six month period okay and then I take the ninety five thousand times what point and it says it was to yield seven percent times point zero seven times one half that gives me what Okay, I'm just going to look at the solution, guys, because we don't have time for, for me to sit here and wait for you to calculate them. So, okay, so we go ahead and we do what? We take the, uh, now I can't find any clear space here. That gives me 300 and... Um, 3,325, the 0.07 divided by 2, 3,325, okay? So that's going to come to 3,325. Three thousand three hundred and twenty-five, and we've got what? A 325 dollar difference don't we okay now that 325 dollar difference we're going to amortize the discount aren't we okay so we'll go ahead and we'll do what we'll debit cash for how much are they getting three thousand we will credit the interest revenue for three thousand three hundred and twenty five and we'll credit the discount for 325 right Okay. Now, when we credit the discount for 325, we take 5,000 minus 325 gives me what? How much? 4675. 4675. So now the discount is what? 4675. Um, four six seven five. So now the carrying amount of the bond is what ninety five thousand three twenty five. 
it's come up by the amount of discount amortization. So for the second six months, I'll do what? I'll take 95,325 times the 7% times one half is going to give me what? Say it again. Three 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 six. Okay. Point what? 3.375. Okay, good. That's gonna be the interest what for the well it can't be thirty three thousand. You got me to too many threes here, huh? Three thousand three hundred and I had it right? Okay. So it's three thousand Three, yeah, three point uh, three seven five. Okay, and so now I do what? I take that's for the second six months. So I take those two amounts together. Three plus what? Three, two five, and add those two together, and that should give me six something or seven something. Why am I seeing something different? What did they ask me? Oh, in his journal entry record, the second period of interest. Okay, it wasn't asking me the whole interest for the whole period. It was just asking me for the second period. And so what? It's about that number you guys gave me, 3336.375. Okay, so you had to do what? You had to get that new carrying amount for the second six months and multiply that times the... 7% times one half. Okay. Okay, good. And you can see the way they did it there. It's just that it's a little bit, you don't see how they've amortized the discount. That's why they added the 325, but that's the interest for the second six months. Okay, I thought they were asking for the whole year. That's why I was trying to add them together. All right, number eight, the income statement reports changes in fair value for which type of investment? It is what? Trading. Securities, okay. Number nine, Athens Inc. brought the bought the following. What amount will be reported um, on the balance sheet? And they give me some choices here, don't they? Now these are trading securities, so my inclination is what? Fair value, okay. I mean, I have to use the fair value, and I add up all the fair values, and when I do, I get a hundred and. 60,000 when I add up all those fair values. And if you look at the rest of the numbers, they don't make any sense. They're sitting there and they're what? Mixing back and forth some cost, some fair value, of which I have no information to answer this question in that manner. So you lock into what? It's got to be I added up the fair values to get the 160. There is no method where you mix them if they don't tell me anything about these investments, right? And so it must be that they're carrying them all as current. Okay. Okay. Um, number 10, regarding fair value accounting for investments in equity securities will generally apply to an investment where we are what? Regarding fair value uh, through net income, less than 20%. Number 11, when an investor accounts for investment in common stock at fair value through net income, cash dividends are considered dividend income. Okay. Number 12, Boulder Inc. began business on January 1st and had the following investments. And all declines in value are deemed to be temporary. How should the corresponding losses be uh, reflected? Okay, and so I'm going to do what? I'm going to look at the available for sale. Difference there is what? 2,500. I look at this one. Difference there is 6,000. Okay, and so we sit there, and the answer there you can see is C, right? 
One's on the income statement, one's on other comprehensive income. If POP owns 50% of common stock, typically we would do what? Would record dividends received as investment revenue? Number 17, if POP company exercises significant influence over Sun and owns 40%, we would record 40% of net income of Sun as investment income each year. Number 18, when using the equity method to account for an investment, cash dividends received by investors when we're using the equity method is a reduction in the investment account, isn't it? Right? Okay. And we will do number 19 on Tuesday. Be, uh, I mean, on Monday. What's today? Wednesday? On Monday, be looking... Um, probably tomorrow, Friday, for the practice midterm. So we'll do this one question. I'll probably just pop, plop it on that practice midterm, and we'll do that, and we'll do some more questions for chapters, what, chapters 10, 11, and a little bit of 12, okay? All right, make sure you have uh, signed in today, and I will see you on Monday.